busted flat in Baton Rouge, waiting for a train. I was feeling just as faded as my jeans. Bobby thumbed a diesel down just before it rained. And rode us all the way to New Orleans. I pulled my harpoon out of my dirty red bandana. I was playing the soft while Bobby sang the blues, yeah. Windshield wiper slapping time, I was holding Bobby's hand in mine. We sang every song that driver knew. Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Nothing. I mean, nothing, honey, if it ain't free. Yeah. Oh, feeling good was easy now when he sang the blues. Yeah, feeling good was good enough for me. Mm -hmm. It was good enough for me and my mom and my gal. From the Kentucky coal mine to the California sun. Yeah, Bobby sang the secrets of my soul. For all kinds of weather, through everything that we've done. Yeah, Bobby, baby, he checked me from the cold. Oh, one day out near Salinas, now I let him slip away. But he was looking for that home, and I hope he finds it. Because I trade up my tomorrows for one single yesterday. To be holding Bobby's body next to mine. How do I sound? Is it robotic again or is it normal? Please tell me. I mean, I'm not going to be able to do anything for it, I guess, so it doesn't matter. Okay, good. I'm glad. I apologize for the robot sound last night. I hope it made sense anyway. Ah. All right, cool. I'm glad everyone could listen to it. So we're starting our China book, a tiny little China book. Little China guy. Little bitty China guy today. A little fun little tiny China Jack, China man. A little marzipan called uh, the China Boom. Honestly, it should be the China Boom question mark because uh, they're not too down with... He's not too down. The author, Hua Fen Huang not down with the thesis that the Chinese uh, are representing some alternative to the global capitalist order or some inheritor of it. Uh, he lays out in the intro that the thesis of the book will be that China is one capitalist state among the other capitalist states in the world uh, system and that it is dependent upon the United States and its uh, and the American headquartered global order for its coherence and, uh, and, and state capacity. So we'll see. We'll see if he's right and we can talk about it. I might, if anybody has a book that like wants to make the argument that China is something different and like it does uh, represent a, a, a phase shift, a change, uh, I'd be willing to hear it. But uh, that's not what we're getting out of this book. And I have to say, having read the first half, you know, it's obviously a very breezy and uh and uh general but it does paint a strong picture uh and part of the reason he does that he does that is because one thing that won me over to the book very early so in chapter one a mark a market without capitalism 1650 to 1850 where he talks about basically the uh the Qing dynasty the king dynasty is Qing dynasty the Qing dynasty the the manchus the last dynasty of china uh, the one that was in power during that big, uh, the great diversions uh, between Europe and uh, the rest of the world, but also specifically China. And right off the bat, uh, uh, Huang is asking the question, why did uh, capitalism not emerge in China? And to answer that question, he brings to brings to bear a lot of the uh, tools, thinkers that I have been really influenced by in the last few years. So I was like, okay, he's uh, correct. He knows what he's talking about. Congrats. Uh, carry on. Uh, because the first chapter is uh, basically answers that question. Why does, do we find 
uh, China having to become a capitalist country in the late 20th century and not, you know, the same time that England was becoming one. And uh, the answer that is uh, sketched out in this chapter is that while you still you had thriving markets and you had a thriving uh, uh, trade and merchant economy with manufacturing too, with like workers, like you had all the stuff that you saw in Europe, the stuff that got turned into in Europe capitalism, but it was not ever coordinated into uh, a power within the Chinese uh, state that could assert itself the way that the bourgeois asserted themselves in Europe. Now, Huang's answer for why that is, is that there was a interventionist, paternalist, imperial uh, over uh, sovereign. A, 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 there was, you had localized like commercial networks uh, that could never uh, take over the regulatory power of the state the way that the capitalists could do it in Europe because there was this overarching authority, the empire, which was able to, for one thing, was able to intervene in conflicts between workers and employers in favor of workers, which increased the cost of uh, investing in capitalist industry, which disincentivizes investment in capitalist industry. Now, the reason they're able to do that is because of their robust bureaucratic capacity, the imperial uh, uh, bureaucracy, which is uh, a centrally administered uh, uh, system to administer the state, which has tendrils everywhere and is made up of people who pass the famous imperial exams. We know that it was a failure to pass those exams that led uh, to the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom to be uh, established when somebody got a bad grade on one. So not, but not, but there's a there's a two sides to this bureaucratic power. One, it intervenes and undermines uh, capitalist interests in the in the regions where capitalism is kind of coming into being, and two, it provides somewhere for people who acquire wealth in merchants in merchant set, uh, in merchant investments. Uh, it, it gives them a better option to send their kids and to spend their money. Because there was so much money associated, so many, uh, so much uh, advancement, so much social, uh, uh, social credit, and social distinction, and so much like actual cash in the imperial bureaucracy that merchant families, instead of becoming you know long term dy dy uh, dynamic like banking families, you know, like your fucking Medici's and your Rothschilds. In, in the in the in Europe, within a few generations, a lot of that uh, merchant uh, wealth gets dissip dissipated. People spend it educating their kids so that they can become high-ranking civil servants. Which this a, a, a different uh, this sort of phenomenon is another reason that France is a, is a reason that France relative to England uh, has a later capitalist development because the the French practice of selling offices and making the selling of those offices uh, inheritable inher uh, gave the uh, the cap the people who had money uh, in early modern France uh, a incentive not to uh, uh, risk it on a speculative uh, colonial ventures or or risky finance schemes or 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 capital intensive uh, and therefore dangerous uh, industrial schemes. Just buy offices. You get a better return. So this means that there is no autonomous, organized capitalist class emerging amongst all this capitalist action that's happening uh, in the early modern period when China gets a wash in silver. Basically, uh, the commercial economies of China and Europe were supercharged by the infusion of New World American silver. And why is that? Pure old-fashioned exploitation. It's all, at the end of the day, it is grinding money, gold, out of blood. Uh, and, and it was doing that, that that created this commercial revolution. But in China, uh, there were all these things militating against the organization of autonomous merchant, society, merchant uh, groups. But if you were, but the thing is, 
Chinese society, just like European society, created people who, by inclination and interest and ability, wanted to be capitalists, wanted to do merchant stuff. But what did they do in China? Now, in Europe, they took over. They literally coordinated to take over control of their smaller and therefore more easily conquered medium-sized uh, states, as opposed to the untouchable Chinese imperial state, which has so many interests within it be, that go beyond and contradict the interests of the merchants in the cities. They have to fucking worry about the peasants having a fucking revolt. Every 300 years of Chinese empire, uh, people start starving, they do a revolution, and then they put in a new fucking uh, emperor. That's that's how you lose the mandate of heaven, is getting the fucking peasants pissed off at you. Who the fuck cares what some fucking merchants have to say? Their influence is nothing. But, they, so they couldn't fight the state. Some of them stayed and, you know, kept, kept grinding it out in China, but a lot of them left. And they created uh, Chinese diasporic merchant colonies all through Asia. Uh, from Taiwan to Macau to... Uh, Southeast Asia and Indonesia and Manila, Philippines, where they were trading with Europeans and trading with locals. And it's very interesting. You see in Asia uh, a recapitulation of the sort of cycles of pogroms that happened to Jews in Europe, but against Chinese uh, colonies in the rest of Asia. Because the Chinese in those cities stood for what Jews stood for in the European uh, context. Um, the merchant class, the people who held your fucking uh, banknote, the, the pawnbrokers, the people who, in a in a burgeoning mer uh, merchant society, uh, are on the top, have the have the upper hand in these in this new marketized world that peasants and recent peasant arrivals to cities can't compete with, and they get pissed when things go bad, and they go and they beat people up. And of course, they think it's fucking. They think it's because they're Chinese, just like Europeans thought it's because they're Jewish. But no, it is an expression. It's a folk expression of alienation and fear at being immiserated in this new way, in a way that you can't fight against. But there's nowhere to fight. It's a mystery. It's a phantom. It is not. It's it's a it's it's a ghost. So you can only take it out on people. But anyway, what this means is that China just kind of stagnates there. And it doesn't really get forced to, to try to do modernity until the European gunships show up uh, and basically force them into the new trade economy. So that's the first chapter. That going through that history, and I really like it because it echoes a lot of the stuff I've been saying. So I love being affirmed. Yes, I'm correct. Thank you. But I, I this is why I love the Scheidel book so much. By the way, I keep talking about the Wolf, uh, the Walter Scheidel book, End of Rome, because the thing that gets you as a kid is the fact that when you do the but why thing with an adult, you get to the point where everybody just kind of puts their hands up, you know. And that's true of so many attempts to explain. Uh, historical phenomena and sociological phenomena. You just sort of have to shrug at a certain point. But with the Scheidel thesis, you know, you get to an answer, a question that has a definitive answer and that does not beg another question. Because with, with Huang's description here of the Chinese uh, imperial state intervening to prevent capitalism from emerging, why would they do that? The answer he gives is because of the paternalistic eth ethics that mask the uh, material interest in maintaining stability. The emperor wants to maintain stability. And capitalism, capitalist action, capitalist uh, behavior is destabilizing inherently. So, of course, he wants to stop it. The reason Europe got capitalism is because no sovereign existed who could impose that will from that, from that uh, position. You had these small to medium-sized states, which could be taken over effectively by their bourgeois, because everybody was trying to get money to fight wars with each other. They had wars to fight with each other. If they lost the wars, they would lose their dynasty. And so they empowered these merchants and these financiers in order to fuel their war machines. And that means they give over their own sovereignty because the the because that long-term sacrifice uh, in their minds is better than in the short term being dispossessed by losing a, an existential war with one of your other European rivals. 
And of course, all of that is, you know, being fueled by class conflict at the base. Like you have to fight and conquer because you have no stable center in a class society. But Scheidel goes further because you can say, well, why did they have a why did they have a fucking empire? And the Europeans have a bunch of warring statelets. A bunch of people have had explanations about culture, about language, about religion. But Scheidel says, because of the fucking step nomads. Because the the risk of attack from a completely different social order that is able to mobilize military effectiveness at a level that a settled society simply cannot do because of the necessity necessity of a division of labor and will roll over you if you do not fully mobilize against that uh, threat. And, there's, and then you say, well, why did they have to worry about that and the Europeans didn't? The answer to that, because that is where the step is. And you're done. There's no way the step there right? The step's there because that's where the step is. We're done. That's why I love the Scheidel thesis, because it gets you to literal bedrock. So you've got this dying Qing dynasty that's being racked by internal conflict. There's, They have this balancing act between the the the, the rural landowning gentry the uh imperial uh, uh bureaucracy the uh local authorities and local uh, magnates of the various uh trades and industries and then the fucking peasantry who were for the most part free te free tenants they pay, they had they owed money to a landlord but that's it the, the feudal arrangements had been smashed uh, uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, but what that meant, of course, is over time, uh, there is a dispossession at the bottom. You get people shaken out of ownership, and specifically the people who moved from northern China to southern China, the, the Hakka. They moved from northern China, desolate, prone to attack by steppe nomads, to the more uh, rich lands of the south, where they have no stake, where they have no uh, property, and because they're starting from the bottom, have a difficult time acquiring any. So you've got this restive co population fight, uh, you've got this constant class conflict in the countryside caused by this sort of friction between the landless uh, uh, farm laborers, peasants, and, uh, and landowners. And now you've got the West showing up and saying, hey, you guys got to buy our opium or else we're going to blow you up because you have, otherwise you have, you, you've been taking all this silver. We, we, have, we need to rebalance the third trade. We need to make you buy this opium because we know people will smoke it. Uh, and right after that, you have the fucking Taiping Rebellion. It's this collapse. And, and so there's this frantic effort after the Taiping are put down uh, to like China, like Japan did at the same time, modernize. But all you're really doing is empowering these regional military powers, these warlords, who had been empowered to defeat the Taiping. And then after the war, become centers of regional power that are able to grab all that surplus that's being organized now, that's being rationalized, and put it towards their little military fiefdom, which is not creating the dynamic com uh, commercial economy that you would need to compete with the West. Like, it's interesting. So, when the uh, when the Ming Dynasty collapses in the mid 1600s during the same little ice age uh, ecological crisis that caused 30 years more in Europe uh, and um, uh, several Ottoman sultans being uh, overthrown in a very short period of time. Uh, they lost the mandate of heaven for the same reason that all those other forces did. Uh, and there was, as had happened historically, a bandit king, a disaffected postman. Uh, who got fired and then went in the hills and became a, a bandit king, led a huge host that rolled their way to the capital. That had happened historically. That was how, that was the cycle of Chinese history. But this time, uh, one of the generals of the of the Ming, uh, who's guarding the gate of the fucking uh, Great Wall uh, to keep out one specific step nomadic group, the, Man the Manchus, invites them through the gate with the proviso that they would help him 
restore the Ming. So that last dynast who overthrows the Ming, he gets about a year in power before the Manchus roll up. And then once they get in there, they realize, oh, this machine has completely rotted away. We can just take it over. And then so there's this violent, bloody, uh, uh, prolonged war uh, between the remnants of the Ming and the, the Manchu, and they eventually take over through their military, basically the contractors they hired. And at the end of the Manchu, when the Taiping have taken over the most productive lands between the Yellow and Yangtze rivers, like they would taken over the heart, the middle of the Middle Kingdom, uh, the the uh, Manchus held on because of Western military in intervention on behalf of them, because they, they wanted somebody that they knew that they could deal with, whether than rather than some weird millenniary freak who might decide to you know do communism or something, uh, and. Also, the empowerment of these local military leaders who are given an ability to uh, uh, grab surplus to create a machine that, that can take down the Taiping. And once it does, these are new nodes of power. That was So that by the time the Republican Revolution happens, 1911, I believe, uh, they're basically uh, uh, Sun Yat-sen and his buddies are just taking over an empty. They're 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 storming an empty palace. The power is out in these warlord areas, and so that leads to this slow, steady consolidation as the nationalists and the communists allied, largely because of Stalin's insistence, uh, roll up through these these warlord uh, fiefdoms and uh, suborn them to a central authority. This is the second chapter, Primitive Accumulation, that we're on now. Uh, and, of course, eventually the, uh, the nationalists betray the communists. Duh. Uh, the, they're, they're destroyed in the cities, uh, in part because of a very... Uh, uh, ill-advised strike, general strike, attempted in Shanghai, one, once again, the insistence of Stalin, that gets massacred and leads to the, the party sort of rearranging itself. Where? Among what social base? The base that has historically overthrown uh, uh, empires that had lost the mandate of heaven, the dispossessed, land, the dispossessed landless Hakka peasantry of the South. But the nationalists can't hold power. They, the Chinese, the Japanese invade. Japanese are defeated. The Chinese nationalists are kicked off of the mainland, and you have now finally, sort of, I what I can sort of consider the completion of the Taiping Rebellion, which is the victory of the Chinese Communist Party, because what it is is it is the it is the m modern challenge to the not just the, the, the specific regime of the Qing dynasty, but of the notion of dynastic politics as it, had, as it had been understood, and the assertion of a nationalist, a national, a modern national concept. That, of course, because it's reacting to sort of a stultified social order, has to involve a, a uh, ideological um, structure that is from that is imported from abroad of abroad it has to be imported from abroad because capitalism is being imported from abroad the fucking opium the, those the, the 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 trunks of opium getting unloaded in in shanghai and fucking hong kong uh that was capitalism showing up and so a new uh, china had to re respond to this and that that had to be a chinese response and so first it's the guise of christianity uh, and then uh, Marxism, which, of course, one is the continuation of the other, the attempt to find a human heart in the social and economic machine that we're living in. So when the, when the Chinese or the communists take power, they are now locked in a new world created by the, 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 world, the, the, the internationalization of capitalism. We have now reproduced the medium state competitive framework that had dominated Europe and that led to the uh, rise of capitalism. We have exported it to the world. Now everybody is a fucking medium-sized state fighting with every other state 
for existential survival, the which is the survival of the specific regime of power. And so, what do you do? You have to build your productive forces. And how do you do that? The same way everyone does it. There's only one way to do it. There is no weird trick to defeat this. It is mass exploitation and domination of peasantry. It is taking people who work the land and making them work harder. As we said, uh, as I've said before, like uh, farmers only work as hard as they have to because it sucks to do. It's, 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 it's tiring work. You wouldn't work harder than you had to. So you work to sustain yourself. That's not enough to create the surpluses that you could direct to investment and make modern technological capitalism possible, allow you to compete with the other states. So that is why the Russians had did what they did. That's why the, the, the famines and then the decollectivization. The Chinese did the same thing, the Great Leap Forward. First, they tried to export industry to and make it a small scale in the countryside because that's where people lived. They tried to not uproot them. They're going to have people smelting pig iron in their backyards, like next to the barn. And of course, that was absurd because the whole reason the cap that, that industrial capitalism works is that it brings together capital, that it concentrates it. It's like it concentrates surplus. It does not distribute it. Its job is to bring it into a center, like you're doing the opposite. And that helped lead to 30 million people dying, which is exactly what they needed. They needed a, to free up that goddamn land. You cannot have a change in a mode of production without some drastic change in the relationship between the people and the land. Uh, feudalism was in terminal decline, or it was in terminal stagnation uh, when the first plague ship showed up from uh, in Venice or wherever. Um, there was too many people on too little land. It had lost, there was no longer, the, the, the land was losing its fecundity. It was producing less with more work. It's, it's a downward spiral and there was no way to break it up. Then the Black Death comes and people start being able to move. People can negotiate different deals with landowners and specifically they can move through the, the cities. And it's that urbanization that starts, that sets off the cascade of reactions by different elites that lead to the specific bringing together of different innovations in a specific place that is then exported elsewhere. And here's, of course, the real joke. All the horrors that are put at communism's doorstep. The millions killed by communism. That is the price, not of communism, but of primitive accumulation, which necessary, which must happen to have any kind of advanced technological society and it is you have to concentrate the agricultural surplus and that means making peasants work more than they want to that means introducing the market market compulsion or the barrel of a gun one way or the other depending on the the uh, sophistication of your machinery now the reason that capitalism gets off the hook is because all of their famines all of their repressions happen to people who don't count to be part of the polity like, uh, I, I was listening to one of the wrap-up uh, episodes of Mike Duncan's Revolutions podcast about revolutions, and he's, or no, it was one of the last ones about the Soviet Union, and he's looking back at collectivization, and he says, like, the Soviets did this amazing thing of creating, out of a medieval backwater, a modern industrial economy in, like, 20 years. That is revolutionary and wild. And then he says, but when you look at... Uh, the horror that that required, and then you look at, like, the way that England, for example, industrialized, uh, there's so much less violence and horror, you know, there's other ways to do it. No, he is forgetting that that violence and horror all happened, it just all happened in India. It happened to Indians. And not just this, and by the way, not just the deaths from uh, from famine, but also all the deaths from repression, all the all the gulag shit, all the, all the uh, arbitrary detentions and executions that is the reality of colonial administration. But because it happened to this other, the process at the center gets off the hook. I mean, that's how it's allowed to go that long because it displaces the horror. We would not countenance the horror. What allows us to countenance the horror, in this case, was distance, but 
in the 20th century is the creation of an actual living faith, communism, that can activate behavior. We have to do this. And by many measures, they all did. The Soviets were in a situation where they had no other option. The reason that a fucking thug, the reason a gang leader, a criminal, and not some sort of uh, Soviet like worker intellectual took power is because the thug was the only one who had the stomach to do, to th the stomach to embody what was going to have to happen if the Soviet Union was going to survive. Now, there were people who said maybe don't let the Soviet Union survive, uh, like Bukharin, buy off the peasants and uh, and and get us off the train to uh, modernity. And I got to say, that might have been the right move. I kind of think it was the right move. But that would have meant the dispossession of the Soviet uh, ruling class, the, the, the party. And they didn't want to do that. Who wants to give up their power? And it, not even because of selfish reasons, because you don't trust anybody else to have the vision or faith uh, to do it right. So, like, the horrors of the Black Book of Communism is just one chapter in the Black Book of Modernity, the Black Book of Cap, the greater Black Book of Capitalism, because everybody is forced once capitalism is capitalism is established to adapt, and that is why the Bolsheviks all banked on a world revolution so that they wouldn't everyone wouldn't have to fucking do what had already been done in terms of horrible, brutal exploitation. That you could slow the pace at the center slow the pace of accumulation, and then redistribute uh, uh, power to modernize at like a retail speed rather than at the wholesale butchery demanded by capitalism. But if you're one state among many, whether you're the Soviet Union or Mao's China, you are a capitalist state because you have to respond to capitalist incentives in the world market. I don't know how you can argue against that, honestly. So they had so they industrialized on the back of the peasantry. 30 million died in the 50s, but then what's this in the 60s thanks to a huge program of rural development and the and uh, a uh, health, rural healthcare and literacy system, all of a sudden education rates, literacy rates, uh, uh, life expectancy, quality of life in the peasant in the rural area, excuse me, in the rural areas goes up. They were able to actually direct that surplus. Yes, it killed 30 million people, but it didn't just go into capitalist pockets willy-nilly the way it does when it happened in India. That's the difference between India and China at the end of the day. Is they had Lenin, or they had Mao, just like Russia had Lenin, and they had Gandhi. So what this gave them is this ability to invest infrastructure, ports, factories, like uh, 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 power capacity. That gives them the ability to to do the things you need, you know, to offspin economic activity from from a center of dynamism, and even extend some of that to the rural communes. Uh, because they did do full collectivization in the countryside as they had in Russia, because that's what you got to do. You don't think they did that in India? It wasn't collectivization. They didn't put them on. Uh, but what they did is they said, hey, your old system of handicraft, uh, 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 like production, uh, and your system of like cyclical uh, provision of like. The cyclical storage of surplus for future use to uh, mitigate against changing conditions because the, the, those 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 famines in India are cyclical. There is a cyclical drought everywhere, but historical uh, peasant life uh, peasant uh, subsistence lifestyles of the Indians had allowed for the creation of like surplus to be reserved. So when there was a dr a, a drought. Uh, the, the Raj forced Indians into a market relationship that meant that there was no more fucking place to put any uh, surplus but on the market.
And so you say, oh my God, they're horrible. They, that's horrible. They did it on, on the backs of the peasantry. Well, you know what that means though? They didn't have to borrow money to do it. They didn't have to borrow a bunch of fucking foreign money to do it, which is what everybody else was doing during the 60s and 70s. And spe- including in the fucking, like the Eastern Bloc, uh, uh, Poland had something like 44% of their GDP was debt uh, by the time of uh, the uh, the Volcker shock. Because you had first the petrodollar flush of the 70s, when all of a sudden the oil boom means there's all this petro money. that It's not staying in the Saudi. The Saudis aren't keeping it. They're putting it back out there. So it goes into bank accounts and it gets lent back out at a certain rate of interest. And it got lent back out to all these countries that were trying to borrow their way to a development rather than do the do to their peasantry. And either because their structures, well, one way or another, because their structures wouldn't allow them to do it. So they borrowed a ton of money. But what that means is that when Volcker shock comes in and the, these economies start collapsing and, and uh, the pressure on the Soviet bloc becomes unbearable, China has largely avoided that trap. They don't have to do the shock therapy. And so that starts in 1980. They have this capacity that they don't have to give away. They don't have to give off to, they don't have to sell off, which is essentially what happens everywhere else. All those state assets get sold off in the Soviet Union and in all those formerly developmentalist states, uh, those those former uh, import substitution regimes in Latin America and in Africa, Boom. Overnight, that stuff becomes property of international finance capital. All that all that capacity that they built up during the Cold War. Except China. China gets to keep theirs. And that means that they now have a chance to direct their own response to this new uh, uh, economic conditions. as a, And this new, their new uh, status as like a competitor on the global stage. And you could argue that all those deaths were worth it. And the, you could also say that that's monstrous and that nothing can be thought of in those terms. But the reality is nobody was doing it with the goal of killing all those people. They were doing it with the goal of trying to build communism. And you could say, no, you're just building capitalism. But everybody was doing that. There is the, there is the uh, wiring that we're... Like, there is the incentive structure that's, that determines our behavior. And then there is our imagined story we tell ourselves about why we're doing things. And those things are not the same. And there is conflict between them. And if the conflict between those things is politics, is us working through, like, oh, like, what do we have to do? And then how do we go about doing it because who we think we are? And that's always being done. And the tragedy of the communist capitalist system is that it allows people to act out of real... Uh, earnest desire to do the good thing, but end up reinscribing the worst thing you could do. All right, so the last chapter is the capitalist boom, 1980 to 2008. So this is when they do the, the Deng Xiaoping, who, like, Mao had his number at first. Like, Mao, he was, he was uh, d- denounced and fell from power during the Cultural Revolution, he was purged as a rightist, but he was allowed to. Uh, he was rehabilitated because uh, once the the uh, Cultural Revolution ends, once that energy is uh, sputters out, the legitimacy of the regime is completely threadbare. The only thing that's going to keep people uh, on board is rising living conditions, not the Iron Rice Bowl, which was the guaranteed social welfare contract that had characterized Mao as China. The Iron Rice Bowl, it was a guarantee of, uh, of uh, housing, education, uh, health care, uh, food. Now, it wasn't always going to be good, or a lot of food, or, or uh, good housing, but it was guaranteed. But that's, in, this, in the new world, in the new commercialized world, in the new collected, wired world with televisions and blue jeans... You can't r- run on. You can't run a regime on revolutionary austerity. You took that as far as it could go. The thing cracked, and then you had to rebuild. So you have to give people a consumer horizon to replace that extinguished political one, and that is what they started doing in the 80s. First thing they did was they break up the peasant communes. 
But it, but very importantly, what they don't do is they don't change the system, the household registration system that China uses to uh, arbitrage uh, labor costs, basically. Because in China, you are your access to social goods is predicated on your place of birth. And that is can be waived. Like right now, there's tons of landless workers who've moved to cities, but because they moved, they don't have those ac access to those rights, basically. And that makes them more vulnerable. It makes you makes them uh, more willing to work for less money. So you get the rise of these state-owned enterprises, which become these regional centers of power because the center sort of disintegrates during this period. Uh, the power at the center of the, the PMC is... PRC is replaced by these regional parties, uh, and they're getting more and more uh, discretion over what to do with the money because it's an experimental time. The, the local regions are, it's, 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 the, it's, it is, the, the degree to which guys like Schumpeter and Hayek are correct is really shown in the way that they did this, the way this came about. There was a efflorescence of state money from state banks going to uh, uh, state-owned enterprises in regions which were controlled by the local party elites and bureaucrats. And and they become these local power centers that are taking on all of this uh, cheap loans that they never pay back. And this causes a, uh, a, a problem in the 90s. Uh, and eventually the rise of mega companies so out of these sort of regional boom bust cyclers these you know you could you could compare them to uh andrew jackson's pet banks in the united states like if you can imagine them building capitalism in 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 the 1980s and 90s the way that uh, capitalism was built in the, our early american period like the eight, eight, six, 1820s 1830s you have these these pet banks uh that are eventually consolidated uh, and one of the examples that he uses in the book is that there were this, there was for a long time in China, a patchwork of uh, telephone companies and mo mobile companies that provided, uh, that provided uh, telecommunications. And what happened is, is they all got brought together and under one name, uh, China Mobile, which sold a portion of its uh, ownership on the stock market. It became a stock that is owned by private co companies and it becomes funded by uh foreign money the majority share is held I mean, that's that's the key to this entire structure is that all these industries the majority share of ownership is held by the state but the, but there is a minority share of the state of the of these companies that is owned by uh private company corporations which is how privatization happened in the rest of the world but here it is managed and sort of uh uh, uh controlled by a sovereign party as opposed to the way that the fire sale destruction of communism in the, uh, the east, uh, eastern Eastern Europe, uh, was met with just uh, the collapse of any ability to prevent anything from getting privatized. Let me see some more of this stuff. So when they get rid of the iron rice bowl. They increase the ability, the, your your ability to, to make money in these private enterprises or these these public enterprises that are paying out like money to people within it and become you know patronage networks. Uh, so people are making more money, but whenever you get rid of that floor, people start falling through it, and so you have an increase in unemployment and an increase of uh, 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 of social dis dislocation. A lot of these state-owned enterprises, because they aren't making money, for uh, start shedding employers, start employees, start firing people, uh, and this all leads to a a anti-government movement that culminates at Tiananmen that gets misunderstood uh, in the West. It's described Tiananmen Square is described as this student uprising of young people who wanted democracy, and there were plenty of young people in Amer in. Uh, from the better families of the party who were in the universities uh, and who wanted greater democratic uh, accountability because in their mind, they, they, cause like, cause the liberalization process is this double-edged sword, right? It's 
It's providing more opportunity. It's providing more uh, a raised standard of living for one group of people. While it is, there's another group of people who are falling through the cracks. They're getting fired. They're losing access to health care, uh, 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 housing. And they are represented in different social circles. There are fewer of those second group of people in colleges. So for uh, when they saw the, the, the China around them in distress, the students said, oh, this liberalization of the economy is good. It's working. We need a concomitant liberalization of our political system. But they weren't the only people at Tiananmen. There were people from the working class who were trying to fight on behalf of that iron rice bowl and on behalf of Chinese socialism. And meanwhile, arrayed against them, you had a divided, what had been a divided uh, Politburo and a divided Chinese Communist Party. It was divided between the reformists like Zhang Xiaoping, who were pushing heavy for economic reforms, and then the hardliners who hated that. But, it turned, but the thing about those hardliners is there were, a lot of them were in the army and what they really want, the reason that they wanted, uh, they didn't want to get rid of uh, the old uh, state uh, managed economy. They didn't have anything to do with like liberating the people. It's because they, it, they, it's part of their power, their conception of control and power. These are the military figures of the regime. They want to run people over. They want to dominate. And, and uh, state control of the economy is an instrument of domination. Meanwhile, the, the, uh, the reformists, they want liberalization. But because they think it will give them and keep them in power. Not because they think it's going to do anything. They can imagine it's for the national purpose. But again, that's just conflated with their best interest as the people in charge. And it's self-interested. In both ways, it's self-interested. Because the, the ruling class is always self-interested. And so they were in conflict over the, the uh, over the over liberalization. But Deng Xiaoping and the reformists were like, okay, crush these people because what if we do get the the the, the, the dumbass libs think if we get more democracy in China, then we're going to get more liberalization. The implicate the real implication of more democracy in China in the conditions of neoliberal reform is you might get people insisting on actual communism. Might be, get people insisting on doing socialism for once. Of course, the, the students, some of them understood that and agreed with it. Other ones just couldn't conceive of that because they'd only seen the good side of, uh, of the economic liberalization. But both sides of the ruling elite could agree, crush these fucking kids because it would give them control. And so the deal that was made after Tiananmen was the hardliners get can keep control of the the uh, uh, political structure and the party, and the uh, liberalization continues. And this goes in the face of everything the dumbass liberals had said, the Western liberals who insisted, no, 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 when you give them a little bit of democracy or you give them some liberalization, they will do democracy. They Eastern Europe did fake democracy, fake bourgeois democracy after they collapsed. China never collapsed. It's able to do something that the other post-colonial powers uh, countries couldn't do. We were forced, first at the barrel of a gun, and then IMF loans and American interest rates to privatize their economies. So now you have a situation where the party leader, the party middle class, they don't want fucking liberalization of of the of politics because. They, these fucking people might vote themselves socialism, and we can't have that. So the economy, so the Chinese economy in the nineties becomes this uh, collection of little feudal fiefdoms, of little. Patriotism networks around families, which is how feudalism worked, and that is how the uh, state enterprise economy of China worked it's in the 90s and aughts. Uh, you can argue that uh, Chairman Xi is trying to break that up or whatever. I don't know. I don't think he really talked. I think this book's a little old, so I might not talk about that, but uh, we can talk about it 
whoever has more information, I don't know that much about what Zizi's up to. But that has been like the conditions of of what's happened is that these local regional state owned enterprises that have foreign capital but are still controlled by boards are able to dispense profits, are able to dispense surplus. Uh, but the thing that really energized the Chinese economy, as we of course know, is their export economy. And that was made by a couple of things coming together. One, the Chinese devaluing of their currency so that it would be uh, have a favorable trade status in, in the, uh, on the global market. And then taking all of these healthy, educated, sort of, uh, 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 or uh, 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 um, I, I don't want to use the word civilized, but urb I guess in some way like uh, urbanized through media or whatever, this new integrated peasant working uh, a peasant labor force. And then by neglect, and, and this isn't anything you probably had to plan because they're sending so much money to the cities. They're putting so much money into investing in this infrastructure for these industries. They are by definition, putting relatively less money in the countryside. So there's rural underdevelopment in the eighties and nineties. So you have deteriorating conditions in the countryside, harder to make money out there. You have this new concentration of foreign and domestic capital in the cities, and it pulls people into them. But because of the household registration system, they're put, put into a legal limbo by moving to cities, which makes them, gives them the same uh, uh, precarious negotiating position that uh, immigrants do in the United States. And the U.S.-Mexico border is the same thing as the household registration thing is in China. It is an artificial fantasy line put somewhere by capital by the, the states that are administering capital and are administered by it in turn uh, to arbitrage labor costs to make it so that instead of having to spend more money on more uh, uh, mechanization like that's the, 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 the capitalist death spiral that Marx envisioned is that it gets so, it, it costs too much over time or competition gets you to the point where you're investing so much in your capital that you get to a technological tipping point when there's no more labor going into it and the whole thing breaks down but what stops that from happening is keeping wages lower in the center so that you can uh use that that exploitation that surplus you're getting from that labor that which is all surplus as opposed to the labor you get out of the machine which is just the labor really you put into the machine actually less than the amount you put into the machine because of fucking thermodynamics that live human labor that surplus you get to fucking you get to live off it but only if there's an, a permanent uh, external flattener on wages and that is the state saying oh you shouldn't be here So that cannot, that's this big pool of educated, civilized, uh, rural labor, the new concentrations of capital, the special enterprise zones on the coast, boom, it explodes. Uh, and it gets interconnected to the global economy so that it becomes this new, uh, not even manufacturer, it becomes the assembler of the world. Because there had been a, while China was in the process of uh, restructuring its economy, there was the Asian tigers that emerged, uh, all of whom were the beneficiaries of Cold War U.S. Uh, largesse and support while they created sort of protected local uh, 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 Whig-style domestic industries. Because that's the thing. If capital just shows up with a fire hose and you are an undeveloped country, they will prevent you from developing. Because it will always be more be more profitable for them to just extract your cheap raw commodities. It will never be more profitable compared to that in terms of return on investment for them as opposed to people in the country who actually get the benefits uh, to industrialize. You have to have during the Cold War, you had to have Uncle Sam's hand on your shoulder saying, it's okay, you can you can industrialize. We even did that for the British to an extent. We, we, we fucking floated their currency way above what it deserved to be because they were England, you know, and we didn't want their feelings were hurt or whatever. And because of the the, the, the Atchison's free crescent theory of, 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 of uh, containing communism through Asia and into the Middle East 
among producers and uh, extraction uh, extractors, like organs of this greater American uh, industrial machine. China, indus uh, China develops industries. Those industries get more developed. Before you get to the tipping point where you've overproduced, the uh, less intensive, less uh, capital intensive industries get exported. So you had something they called the, the, the flying geese formation of, Europe, of, of Asian economies. So you had Japan, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, uh, Saigon, and uh, Hong Kong. And production of different stuff for American consumption was spread amongst them. The highest tech stuff in Japan, second highest in Korea and Taiwan, and then the uh, the, the the least developed, the, the lowest capital uh, production in uh, the Singapore uh, and Thailand. What China does at the turn of the century, once it's finagled most favored nation status uh, and uh, entry into the WTO, uh, is to break all that up and to do all that manufacturing in China, taking every one of those steps and doing it in China. You can't do that in those countries under those capitalist conditions because they cannot organize enough to prevent overaccumulation and crisis. China can do that. And it even stable because that could have led to a collapse of the Asian economy because what are these countries supposed to do now that they can't manufacture this stuff if China's going to produce it all? But instead what happens to stabilize it and reorient the, uh, the manufacturing economy of uh, Asia away from Japan as American proxy to China is by having China be the place where stuff produced in all those other Asian uh, industrial economies is assembled, brought together, and then finally shipped to the United States. So that's the economy that we are now talking about. That's the economy that is being posited as an alternative to global capitalism, a challenge, uh, something else. And uh, the second half of the book is his uh, answer to the question, like, is China gonna, going to take this boom and turn it into hegemony? And uh, I think from reading the preface, his answer is going to be no. Uh, and we'll see exactly why he'll, well, he lays it out next week. Oh, that was almost an hour perfect. Wow, nice. Nice and uh, disciplined. So the title of the book is The China Boom by, what the fuck's his name? I always forget his name. Uh, Ho Feng Hong, that's it. So part two is Global Effects Coming Demise. So that might be a spoiler alert there. That's been very nice. It was raining like crazy here in LA for a while, which was very weird. Uh, but now it's nice and sunny again. It's crisp. It's fall. I didn't think I could get that anymore. I thought I was done. I thought I'd never had another. I'd never have another crisp fall again. I might, if somebody has one, if somebody has a book that like is saying, "Hey, China, China's fresh and it's and they're they're doing something different," I'd like to hear it, because, my, I mean, I like I said, I'm I'm new to it and I haven't studied that much, but, I mean, from what from what China looks to be doing from the outside, it appears to be a country that, adapted to become a modern capitalist state and is now, adapting as we're all doing. It's not, it's not doing anything other than reacting. That's just all we can ever do. We're always only reacting. Billiard balls being knocked around. And the revolutionary fantasy is that we will break through. And I think we will, and we have the phenomenon that occurs. The question is, is China that? Is it a, is it a eruption? And uh, it doesn't seem to be. It seems to be pretty content to just be a state among states. 
uh, and to see the advancement of its influence being, you know, the same as the uh, as the as the drive of any one of these states competing within a framework, but dependent. Here's the crucial part: dependent upon that framework. So we'll see. We'll talk about it next week. All right, folks. Have a good day. Peace and chicken grease.